There have always been those who believe that UFOs, unidentified flying objects, are from outer space. But the truth may be closer to home. I'm a great cynic about UFOs, and I'm quite sure that was mainly our airplanes that were flying around. For over 60 years in top secret research bases around the world, flying saucers have been designed, built, and flown. Secreted away from the rest of the main company is a place where they're building flying saucers. Some even claim to have seen them. There was no mistaking what they were. They were flying saucers. This is the secret history of attempts to harness the technology of the flying saucer to produce the ultimate military plane. These are the real UFOs. The story of the real UFOs begins in Nazi Germany. As victory in the Second World War was slipping from their grasp, German scientists were trying to perfect weapons that might turn the war in Hitler's favor. One of these was Victor Schauberger, an inventor who had produced models for a flying saucer. It had met the promise of a flying machine that could maneuver like a helicopter, but travel at supersonic speed undetected by the enemy. Schauberger's craft utilized a tornado-like vortex, which produced magnetic effects causing levitation. Uh, Victor was, uh, was recognized by the German government, actually met with Hitler, and later was inducted into the SS and uh, put to work further developing this flying saucer concept. He worked alongside a group of brilliant German engineers, including Rudolf Schriever, Andreas Epp, and Dr. Richard Mieter. All produced highly advanced designs. The Germans actually had three separate developmental areas for flying saucers, one at Pinamunda, one at Breslau, and the other at Prague. At all these three facilities, flying saucers flew. The Germans had, in fact, gone far enough into development and testing that aircraft were in the air. And one company, Messerschmitt, and had flown a complete saucer-shaped aircraft. These pictures of the early prototypes resemble photographs of UFOs that would emerge in the coming decades. But this was not the world of science fiction. These were highly advanced UFOs. For the German military, this lethal weaponry was being developed to win the war. The battle for air supremacy in World War II dominated the military struggle in Europe. By 1944, the tide was about to turn against Germany and Hitler's Third Reich. And then on June 13th, a week after the Allied D-Day landings, Hitler unleashed his deadly secret weapons. Over a period of two months, thousands of V-1 jet-powered flying bombs attacked London. Some were shot down from the ground, others in the air. This deadly development in warfare technology was to start a whole new era of military aviation history. The use of flying saucer technology to produce even more efficient killing machines was to be the culmination of this research. During the Nazi period, we had a flowering of new thought, of scientific thought, of technological development. These scientists were, were freed up to do a lot of work. They developed science in every field that is, is relevant in our lives today. And as, and as a matter of fact, we're still living off that carcass. But there was nothing new about the basic principles of rocket science. Since the 1920s and 30s, there had been an explosion of innocent enthusiasts experimenting with rocket propulsion across Europe and America. But what the Nazis were doing was anything but innocent. At their deadly weapons research facilities, scientists were working on a new generation of weapons. And alongside the rockets and missiles, real UFOs 
were a crucial part of that program. One of the incredible things that happened during the Second World War was the, the amount of technology that German scientists were turning out that were, was devoted to a, a war effort. And that included rocketry, it included the jet engines, but it also included some remarkable work in terms of uh, flying saucer craft. But time was running out for Hitler and his scientists. On all fronts, the Allies were breaking through. The Germans were in retreat. The flying saucer technology, just like all of Hitler's other ultimate weapons, would come too late. Even right to the very end of the war, it seems they really believed that these super weapons, these super delivery systems, were going to be able to at least stall the Allies and, and uh, they were going to be able to arrive at some sort of political settlement of the war. Hitler's dream of winning the war with his super weapons never came. By May 1945, the final battle for Berlin had started. The war in Europe was virtually over. But this was only the beginning of the story of the real UFOs. Within three months, the Second World War came to a dramatic and horrifying end. At 8.15 in the morning of August 6, 1945, the Enola Gay, a B-29 American bomber dropped the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima. With the war finally over, the former allies had now become rivals. The Soviet Union and the West would soon be locked in a battle for the latest military technology. Well, at the close of the Second World War, all the former allied powers were engaged in a, in a race to capture uh, German technology. Americans captured the uh, complex uh, for the manufacturing of V2s and the plans for many other missiles, but the Russians captured uh, the latest models of jet aircraft from the Germans and uh, a good amount of uh, rocket scientists. But the key question was who was going to capture the real UFO scientists. The secrets of German rocketry and missiles was not the only technology to fall into Russian and American hands. The Cold War was about to begin, and alongside the very public nuclear arms race, with its displays of missile hardware, there was also another secret arms race going on, which the public knew nothing about. This time, to find the ultimate flying machine, a flying saucer from the world of science fiction. During the Second World War, there was a major technological revolution in jet propulsion, atomic physics, and real UFOs, flying saucer technology. The Germans had led the world in the development of real UFOs, and now their ideas and scientists had fallen into the hands of the two superpowers, Russia and America. German UFO flying saucer engineers Victor Schauberger, Rudolf Schriever, and a Dr. Mita were secretly working for the Americans. While Andreas Epp was reported to be working on flying saucer projects for the Russians. Both Americans and Russians exploited really a lot the scientists that they captured at the end of the war. And they used this technology and these guys to develop their science during the Cold War. By the end of the Second World War, the former Allies had become rivals and the Cold War arms race had begun. The focus of the American efforts went on developing rocket and missile weapon systems. It seemed that the captured German flying saucer technology had been put on hold. Then in 1947, there was a report of a UFO flying over America seen by an American pilot, Kenneth Arnold. He was flying near Mount Rainier in the state of Washington and witnessed nine flying discs some distance from him. When Arnold landed, he told his story to the local press. I was approximately 25 to 28 miles from Mount Rainier, and I noticed 
to the left of me a chain which looked to me like the tail of a Chinese kite going at a terrific speed across the face of Mount Rainier. They looked something like a, a pie plate that was cut in half with a sort of a convex triangle in the rear. Well, Kenneth Arnold started a firestorm. He was able to calculate from known landmarks how fast they were flying and found they were flying at, at, at 12 or 1300 miles an hour. And from his description, once he landed and gave this story to the press, he described these as these objects as if they were saucers skipping on water. And today that's how we have the word flying saucer. From out of nowhere, the flying saucer mystery is with us. What is the flying saucer? What do people see and sometimes photograph? What's behind the daily reports of aerial phenomena in the nation's press? U.S. television and radio began reporting eyewitness accounts of members of the public who claimed they had seen UFOs in the skies over America. I glanced up and there were three flying saucers in a V. Approximately a half a mile away from me at an altitude of 350 feet. Is this what Weisberger saw? America was gripped with UFO sightings and flying saucer fever. The military was eager to deny it was anything to do with them and went on television to reassure the American public. We can say that the recent sightings are in no way connected with any secret development by any agency of the United States. In my position in the Research and Development Organization of the Bureau of Aeronautics and of the Navy Department, I am thoroughly familiar with both our aircraft and our guided missiles programs and can state without reservation that the Navy has no saucer-shaped aircraft or missile in any of these programs. Then in July 1947, in the midst of the UFO fever, came a startling report by another serving American officer. He announced to the press the discovery of remains from a flying saucer found in Roswell, New Mexico. Within hours, the story of the Roswell incident exploded around the world. The American military panicked. Again, they issued an official statement designed to reassure an anxious public, denying the remains were from a flying saucer. They maintained that it was simply a weather balloon. Behind all these American denials was a more ominous possibility for the military. Assuming the UFOs were not from outer space, flown by aliens, perhaps all these sightings were evidence of an enemy closer to home. The American military were inundated by all kinds of UFO reports and that drove them to the idea that perhaps some of those UFO uh, missions were the Soviets in the air. Americans captured the very exotic blueprints of a very advanced de uh, designs for aircrafts and among them there was the Horton 229 uh, by the Horton brothers. And this aircraft was very similar in shape to the first description of a flying saucer sighted over America in 1947. And the Americans were scared that the Russians could have produced actually a flying version of the Horton 229. So in the immediate post-war years, reports of UFO sightings were part of the growing tensions between East and West as the Cold War grew in intensity. In the early 1950s, the Korean War had almost brought the world to a nuclear disaster. In America, the paranoia and the sense of fear of communist invasion was reflected in attitudes to flying saucers in popular culture. Flying saucers have invaded our planet. Washington, London, Paris, Moscow are key targets. The whole world is under attack. The 50s were the golden age of the flying saucer. People were scared by the Cold War. They were scared by the atomic experiments. They were at the same time very keen to the space exploration and to the advancement of technology. So the climate was the right one to expect extraterrestrial visitations from outer space. Invaders 
from Mars. He saw them land from outer space. He saw them capture innocent people only to destroy. But for the American military, the continued rumors and speculation was ideal camouflage for the real UFOs. All over the deserts of America were sites like Area 51, White Sands and Los Alamos, where alongside missile tests and space programs, there were hundreds of other mysterious top secret projects. These included high altitude parachute tests, satellite testing, and the development of future space vehicles. One of these secret programs was called Project Mogul. Project Mogul was a top secret program to listen in on the Russians using equipment on high altitude balloons. The American military were desperate to discover secrets of the Soviet program to develop a rival atom bomb. They needed to know when the Soviets were testing one of their weapons. It was not until 20 years later that the U.S. government was forced to confess that the Roswell incident back in 1947 was in fact secret military testing by the Americans. They published a report which concluded that what was recovered was not the remains of an extraterrestrial spacecraft, but debris from a then classified Army Air Force research project codenamed Mogul. But there was good reason for the Americans to be frightened of the Russians. The experience of the Korean War and the startling appearance of the MiG fighter had proved how advanced Russian military technology had become. America needed to catch up and catch up fast. Could a supersonic flying saucer be the answer? In the 1950s, the race was on to build the ultimate weapon, a radar-invisible supersonic aircraft. What was needed was from the realms of science fiction. The U.S. Air Force, in fact, wanted a new fighter interceptor, something that no Soviet uh, aircraft would look like, a completely new airplane, one that could fly faster and higher than anything else in the air at the time. In 1953, the CIA discovered that Avro, the Canadian aeronautics company, was working secretly on a revolutionary aircraft, a flying saucer. This was the brainchild of a visionary British aeronautical engineer. The genius behind the Flying Saucer project was John Frost. He came from England as a designer on another project, but he soon became intrigued with the idea of taking uh, flying saucers into the air. John Frost had been responsible for one of aviation's most innovative developments, the swept-wing, tailless fighter. The inspiration behind John Frost's first ideas, in fact, came from his collecting a scrapbook of all the UFO reports that were being heralded all over the world. And through looking at every one of the reports, he began to start sifting them down to at least two possible sources. And one was man-made, and he traced it back to Germany. Frost was intrigued by reports of the Nazi flying saucers. In fact, we now have evidence to show that he is a participant in interviewing German scientists, and especially one, Mitha, who would work directly with German flying saucers. Dr. Mitha claimed that he had worked for over 10 years on the Nazi saucer program, and his team had actually built the flying prototype. Mitha showed Frost photographs, plans, and blueprints. Frost was convinced that he could turn Mita's plans into reality. John Frost had the promise of something that no one else could deliver at that point. A supersonic, more than uh, twice as fast as uh, the speed of sound aircraft that could fly higher and faster than anything else out there and never needed a, a runway or any airfield to operate from. In 1952, the Canadian Avro Aircraft Factory concealed one of America's most highly classified and top secret projects. John Frost set up a secret group called the Special Projects Group. It was based on men just like himself, engineers and technicians and scientists that would work on his, his own ideas and, and ideas that would in fact lead to the flying saucer projects. 
One of the aeronautical engineers who worked with John Frost on this revolutionary concept was David Garland. Well, John Frost was frightfully English. You know, he was a typical English gentleman from the public school system, but with tremendous experience in the aviation industry. I'd, I'd say his enthusiasm was infectious. No problem was too big. There's a solution to every problem. In fact, we don't have problems, we have challenges. Uh, there were plenty of challenges. John Frost's very first project is Project Y, a spade-shaped aircraft that's based around his circular pancake engine. It'll be able to take off from the ground vertically or in a rolling takeoff and fly as a supersonic interceptor. Project Y was designed as a tailless jet engine aircraft. It was in effect using flying saucer technology. A spade-shaped mock-up was built by Frost's elite team in a heavily guarded workshop in the Avro factory. In 1953, a model with a delta tail jet flap for vertical takeoff control was secretly tested. The failings of the design soon became apparent. One of the main problems with any tail sitting aircraft would be that the, uh, the amount of pilot skills that would be required to fly vertically from the ground in that position and then in fact to return would be incredible. John Frost now concentrated all the efforts of the special projects team on the development of a circular design, essentially a flying saucer. The circle is the most efficient ground effect machine. You get more lift for a given thrust around the periphery. So it makes sense when you're hovering in ground effect. John Frost's next design was codenamed Y2. And Project Y2 is a completely circular aircraft now using a rotor system in the center of it and multiple engines on the outside edge, powering that rotor, giving it vertical takeoff and eventual direction so it could fly into uh, altitudes that no one else could, could guess. It was a knife-edge supersonic fighter that he was selling. And at this point, the American Air Force bought in in big time with a $10 million grant towards this, his research. By 1956, the Cold War space race and arms race was at its height. The American military was desperate to invest in new weapons technologies. With clandestine American funding, the development of the supersonic flying saucer began. In the Schaefer building was a full-size, 50-foot diameter, six-engine powered aircraft. Now, testing, though, proved that it was a dangerous beast one that nearly killed the entire uh, Frost team. The test was nearly catastrophic. The engines of the saucer tethered in the hangar spun out of control and almost blew the roof of the research lab off. John Frost decides that there's no way that he can continue this work with a complete flying saucer. Supersonic project is abandoned for the time being for him to build a smaller test vehicle that becomes the Avril car. Well, the design specification for the Avro car was to fly at forward speed at 300 miles an hour, some modest kind of speed, but it had a high thrust-to-weight ratio greater than one, and to fly at 30,000 feet altitude, and to land and take off vertically. In 1957, Frost's prototype model finally rewarded the earlier American military investment in his project. The Avrocar was a scaled-down test vehicle that could do two jobs. One, it could provide a test vehicle for the supersonic craft that was still sitting in the Schaefer building. But secondly, it could be the flying jeep that the U.S. Army required. With weaponry, it could actually go on the battlefield as a battlefield weapon. In 1959, the two vertical takeoff prototypes rolled out of the factory. The long-term aim was to produce a flying saucer that could reach over 1,500 miles per hour. It did fly along the runways, de-icing the runways quite nicely, blowing ice and snow around, and it got into trouble over freshly mown part of the airfield when all the grass blew up and came back down in the intakes. And then we started thinking about um, how to prevent what's called foreign object ingestion into the intakes. 
The flying saucer flew several test flights, but its shape meant that it was incredibly difficult to steer. It was a maze of challenges, and the biggest challenge that the concept faced was the pitch instability. The aerodynamic center being so far forward of the center of gravity, <clears throat> it's not a good recipe for a happy flight. So the vertical takeoff and hover principle was working. Modifications were made, but lack of power and inadequate control mechanisms were difficulties that had to be overcome if the Avro car was ever to fly as intended. Apart from the development of powerful pitch control, the only way that we knew to make a circular device stable was to have it spin like a frisbee today. And the spinning action will impart stability. Um, some of John Frost's early designs did in fact have large spinning components. And the gyroscopic power of those devices was, was thought to impart some stability in designs which were thought to go as fast as three times the speed of sound. Frost was convinced he could control the instability problem. But the Americans insisted on adding a swept tail unit. Frost considered this was a betrayal of his original concept. So in December 1961, the $10 million Avro Flying Saucer program was officially scrapped. But some of the engineers who worked on the project did not totally abandon Frost's dream. There really is no aerodynamic future for a circular wing subsonically. Supersonically, with a few modifications and tweaking to its shape to make it a little more like a delta wing, uh, one might see a possible outcome. John Frost always believed his original concept was achievable. Despite the uh, unfavorable results of the Avro car testing, the, the work that John Frost had put into the supersonic project showed that in fact it could have flown. And unfortunately with the money eventually simply stopping, the company shut down the entire project. All the uh, technology went back to the United States, who is the real owners now at that point. The highly classified flying saucer technology went to America. But were these apparent public failures covering up a more covert flying saucer project that later, indeed, would work? This is Jack Pickett. Forty years ago, he was a publisher of U.S. military magazines. He even had positive security clearance. On a visit to MacDill Air Force Base in Florida, he was convinced he saw real American Air Force flying saucers. There was no mistaking what they were. They were flying saucers. There was four of them parked uh, in a row down at that restricted area of the base. And they ranged in size from 20 feet across to about 45 feet to, say, 70 feet. And then the biggest one was 119 feet across. Perfect circles. Jack Pickett had been invited to the Air Force Base to write an article on the recently decommissioned aircraft. Pickett was even shown some remarkable photographs of the aircraft in the hangar. He showed me photographs of many of these aircraft in flight, in formation. He showed me photographs of them with jet escorts, regular type escorts, flying with them. Military researcher Michael Schratt has been investigating the Pickett story for the last 10 years. This one was 119 feet across. Schratt has worked closely with Pickett to produce a series of photo reconstructions of the experimental aircraft which Pickett saw. What Pickett was shown seemed incredible, but he was assured that indeed these were real experimental flying saucers, and this was the evidence that they had actually flown. I said, well, how fast did they fly and how high? He says, well, we achieved space flight with them. And uh, I asked him pointedly, any aircraft that flew that high and that fast, why are you discontinuing them? Why are you scrapping them? He says, well, we've designed better versions with less maneuverability problems. Pickett wrote his article and was ready to publish. 
But at the last moment, the Air Force withdrew permission and took back all Pickett's photographs. He stands by his story and remains convinced of what he saw. Well, I saw the photographs of the men flight. I walked up and touched the actual aircraft themselves. I really examined them. And it was, no question about it, it was a remarkable aircraft and it looked just exactly like what flying saucers are supposed to look like in between. Michael Schrad is convinced by all the evidence that indeed Jack Pickett's story is true. No, I believe that these were the original, true, authentic articles because I've spoken to Jack for over four years now. He's remained consistent throughout, never changed his story. The aircraft that Jack kicked the tires on were capable of 15,500 miles per hour. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's still classified to this day. Pickett's claims came against a background of heightened Cold War tensions. At the beginning of the 1960s, American U-2 pilot Francis Gary Powers was shot down on a spy mission over the Soviet Union. In Europe, the Soviets had built the Berlin Wall, dividing East from West. And with the Cuban Missile Crisis, the world had come closer than ever before to nuclear catastrophe. This could be the beginning of the end for the... As in the 1950s, popular culture reflected the fear and paranoia of the times. And again, it latched on to the threat from outer space. The nations of the world mobilized their armed might, rushing to defend the Earth against the unknown weapons of the super race from the Red Planet. There was suddenly a wave of UFO sightings. We jumped out of the car and uh, stood by the side of the road just as this thing passed over our head, barely above the treetops. It was hovering over the house and was moving side to side directly over this house. And as far as what it was, I wouldn't have the slightest idea. I've been researching UFOs for the last 25 years, and I do believe that most, but all of us, of the witnesses are reliable people having seen something strange in the sky. Most of the times they have seen man-made phenomena or natural phenomena like weather balloons, planets, satellite re-entries, stuff like that. But there is actually a small but significant percentage of sightings that cannot find any explanation at this time. But there was one explanation for these mysterious UFO sightings and it didn't involve extraterrestrial creatures. I'm a great cynic about UFOs, and I I've, uh, would say in a single sentence that practically every UFO, other than those that are being taken by using saucepan lids, uh, every UFO other than those has probably been under contract to the U.S. Air Force. In the 1960s, Alan Brown was working at the Lockheed Secret Experimental Skunk Works in the Nevada desert. It was a time when both Russia and America were afraid of each other's nuclear strike capabilities. The Russians relied heavily on satellite technology to spy on the United States. The Americans invested mainly on manned surveillance aircraft. Lockheed had built the top secret U-2 high altitude spy aircraft designed for covert surveillance over Soviet territory. But it was vulnerable to enemy radar. When the uh, first U-2 was shot down over Russia by uh, surface-to-air missiles, it was recognized even before that time that the U-2's life probably wasn't going to be very long because it was not designed from a stealth point of view. And it was seen that they would have to do something pretty drastic to make improvements. Flying saucer technology might produce the ultimate aircraft, one invisible to radar. A competition was started to replace the U-2. Lockheed, in fact, won the contract, and I was involved with that in an airplane called Have Blue. And the program did change very quickly from a confidential clearance to a top-secret clearance when it was realized just the enormity of what could be done with an airplane which was essentially invisible to radar. Over the next 10 years, shrouded in secrecy, a new generation of stealth fighters 
was rigorously tested in Area 51, the U.S. government flight test base in Nevada. There's no question that you have to have large-scale testing over a large area, which means that there's going to be people on the periphery who are seeing these funny-looking objects flying around, which immediately get reported in the popular press as coming from Mars, Saturn, or you name it. So Jack Pickett's story might be true. Throughout this period, it was the U.S. Air Force that was developing aircraft capable of evading enemy radar. Just what the pioneers of flying saucer technology always promised. What's more, 12 years later, there was another witness who seemed to confirm Jack Pickett's account. Warren Botts, an ex-8th Air Force pilot, saw an identical flying saucer aircraft hidden in a restricted hangar while visiting Wright-Patterson Air Force Base for a pilot's reunion. To my surprise, I saw this huge disc airplane and was almost wall to wall in circumference and it was jet powered from what I saw. I started to walk over to look at it, not thinking anything about it, and a guard, an armed guard, stopped me and told me I'm not allowed to be in there. So I left, but I did see a large circular airplane in there. Michael Schratt now had personal testimony from a second witness of the highly classified flying saucer. He briefly described the exact same aircraft that Jack Pickett had seen it and described other features that uh, Jack didn't describe and so when I put these two men together then I knew I was dealing with a real subject. Despite much skepticism, Warren Botts, like Pickett, remains convinced. People that I spoke to since that time said it never existed which I think they're wrong because I know what I saw. I believe that we do have flying saucers. They did exist and they do exist now. What both men had seen was remarkably similar to the final John Frost Avrocar design, which the American military had reported as abandoned. Many believe that far from being abandoned, research into flying saucer technology had continued. I think it's definitely being experimented today because not only can get to your enemy completely unannounced, but uh, you have radar invisibility, you've got the acoustic invisibility, uh, no runways necessary, you have the potential to fly outside our atmosphere into space, and uh, that is the holy grail that uh, the U.S. Air Force always had wanted from the beginning. There still remains much classified material on the development of flying saucer technology. But by the end of the century, American scientists and engineers had fulfilled many of the hopes and dreams of flying saucers. A fighting machine that could travel at supersonic speed, undetected by radar, based not on a circular disk, but a pyramid. For a period of 15 years, this revolutionary aircraft was classified as a black project, one of America's best-kept secrets. This was the ultimate real UFO, a supersonic strike aircraft, which flew like a jet, but with stealth unseen by radar. In 1988, the Americans decided to reveal it to the world. There's an interesting aspect to the reason why the F-117 was exposed to the public at the end of 1988. The airplanes had been restrained to only flying at night. So the pilots are stuck into this airplane on a totally dark airfield in the middle of Nevada. And we, in fact, did finish up losing a couple of pilots by just purely being disoriented in night flying. At that point, the Air Force decided it had better start flying during the day, and if it was going to do that, it was going to give some indication of what was flying, so we weren't going to get a whole raft of U more UFO reports. In order to evade radar and surface-to-air missiles, 
The Lockheed Stealth Fighter, the F-117, adopted some of the concepts of the flying saucer. Principally, the idea of the shape of the aircraft determined its visibility to enemy radar. We got a radar cross-section that was substantially better than anybody ever expected. And the main reason was that we were, took a different approach to analyzing stealth than had been done in the past and found out that basically a very shallow pyramidal shape with highly swept back edges gave a much lower cross-section than anything had been done before. Within one year of the stealth fighter being declassified, the Soviet Empire began to disintegrate. On November the 9th, 1989, with the collapse of the Berlin Wall, the borders between East and West Germany were open. The Cold War, effectively, had come to an end. But it wasn't long before the stealth fighter saw its first combat, spearheading the assault against a new enemy in the Iraq War. Its invisibility to radar combined with precision bombing, shocked the world. We could go in there, drop the bombs exactly at the altitude we wanted to with enormous precision, and take out exactly the targets we needed without being seen. And the whole of the Gulf War in the 1991 period was conducted where we had thousands of sorties and we didn't even get a scratch on one of our airplanes. The unique abilities of the stealth fighter were demonstrated in the Gulf War, but there remained one basic failing. It had to be designed around the needs of a pilot. Future fighting machines are going to be pilotless. I think the cost, politically and morally, of, of losing highly trained crew these days seems to point in the direction of UAVs unmanned aerial vehicles. There is nothing new about the concept of pilotless aircraft. From the early days of flight, many have experimented with the idea. Some with a degree of success. The development of unmanned spaceflight has opened up future aviation possibilities. The biggest issue in the future is certainly unmanned aircraft. And we can also go down to miniaturized airplanes, which are the order of six inches in diameter, and fly those into buildings. And in fact, the whole scope of what can be done in the future is just enormous. It's mind-boggling. The future is, perhaps, in this new generation of flying machines. The latest Sikorsky Aerobot is capable of high-speed hovering, vertical takeoff, and landing. But these vehicles seem a long way from the dreams of Hitler's flying saucer engineers. Machines on the edge of science fiction, capable of phenomenal supersonic speed. Perhaps the science of flying saucers was never a reality. As long as you stay close to the ground, you've got yourself an efficient lifting device. It does not make an efficient wing in free air at all. It's just not an efficient shape and only flying saucers from outer space have been able to do anything with it. And I think they're probably just a figment of the imagination. Others insist not only that the dream of flying saucer technology is possible, but that concealed from us all, it has already been achieved. I think that this is the, the biggest secret uh, that the U.S. Air Force has, and I believe it's high time that the facts about the U.S. Air Force Jet Power Flying Wing Disc Program be declassified. There's absolutely no threat to the national security, and it's time that this bird come in, into the light. Some of the latest inventions are now in the public domain, but a great many remain secret fueling more speculation over UFO sightings across our skies. The dream of the ultimate flying machine is still unfulfilled. Midway across the first 
We're studying something that's studying us. Nobody told me there'd be days like this. We need to be something fired a beam of light. Doing a certain war, you can imagine. Certainly in our war, you can fire another structure warhead.